I, I spent some time this week, and I wish I could say it was in a good place, okay? Um, there's some things going on that are out of my control, but yet part of my sphere of life. Anybody have that, you know, where you got to live with stuff, and it's like, really? I don't want to live with that kind of stuff, okay? Um, I try to be kind of positive and think ahead and, and try to, you know, hear uh, what God wants from me and, and things. And so this week as I thought about, hey, you know, it's the Sunday after Easter, and we had just a extraordinary Easter um, as people gave their hearts and their lives to Christ and we who are his kids worshiped and celebrated his resurrection that gives us life. And as I thought about it and I and I contemplated, you know, God, what do you want me to to teach on this morning? What do you want me to say? And I wish I could say I had a a definitive answer that I woke up and said, oh, hey, this is it, okay? This sermon this morning kind of comes with the trial of life, the, oh, I, yeah, Father, I need you. And it didn't come out the way I thought it was going to come out. When I preached it in Manhattan or in Gateway this morning, it didn't come out the way I thought it was going to come out. It came out a little differently. So, Good luck is all I'm saying, okay? Uh, God is doing something extraordinary in my heart and in my life. And I've said it in the past, and I really mean it. Um, our call is to be like Jesus. Would you agree? Amen. Okay? I mean, it's how we, how we got to kind of live and think and, and be, and so I've been reading through the Gospels. If, we, if you've been going through the Immerse, you're almost done, okay, if you've kept up. And some of you who haven't kept up, just keep going, okay, just keep going. Um, but start of the book of Revelation uh, this week. We'll read Revelation, 16 weeks, it's done. I'm going to actually start in and read the, uh, the Old Testament because I do that. I read through the Bible once a year, and you can through that Immerse study. Um, but... In, in doing that, God is reading the New Testament. Things just kind of keep coming, okay? And when you're ADD, you do one or two things, okay? You either can't concentrate on anything, okay, where I am most of the time, or you hyperfixate, okay? You, it's like a laser beam. I can't, I mean, that's all I can think about. That's all I can, can focus on. And the strangest things are things I'll focus on. Okay, I mean, it's like, why? Okay, um, it's like chairs in this room. Okay, um, you guys come and sit in them and everything looks great. From my perspective, they're out of order, they're not straight. They're, I mean, I just, every Sunday, and Rod will tell you, it, it's, I try to fix them every Monday, okay? And somebody has the audacity to come in and screw them up. I hyper fixate on it, don't ask me why. Um, but I've been fixating on the kingdom of God. And what that means for us. If we look and, you know, post-resurrection, you know, you'd think that when Jesus would come back that he would, um, and if we read in Acts chapter 1 verse 3, it says, During the 40 days after his crucifixion, he appeared to his apostles from time to time and proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And then this sentence and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Now listen, I'm thinking, you know, Jesus would pull the guys in and say, all right, listen, there's about 120 of you. Now I want to talk to you strategy. This is how we're going to take the world over, okay? And this is how we're going to build the first church, and, and this is how we're going to administrate it, and this is how the leaders are all going to be put in place, and this is how you're going to go from Judea, and then you're going to go to Samaria. He did say that, okay, but this, I figured he'd give a real detailed plan, and we would have a blueprint, you know, of how we're supposed to church plant and how we're supposed to grow the body. And I'm, He doesn't. And i got to be honest, I thought to myself, Jesus, Why? I could have really used that right now. 
You know, as we're growing and we've got three campuses and there's some other things on the horizon that will blow everybody's mind again, okay? Why a little church with a little budget and, you know, all of this, how God uses volunteers and, and the kingdom's expand. I could have really used a plan, Jesus. But it says, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Well, Jesus began his earthly ministry with the same thing. The two bookends of his ministry are the kingdom of God. When you read the New Testament, especially the, the Gospels, you see the kingdom of God mentioned over and over, or the kingdom of heaven. They're synonymous. They, they, it's talking of the same thing. I think it's important that, and, and I've got to be honest, it's something I haven't preached a lot on. I don't hear a lot of sermons on the kingdom of God. I don't hear a lot of what's going on. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, it says, Jesus said the promised time of God has come at last. He announced the kingdom of God is near or the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. That's how he began. And he ends... There in Acts saying, you know, listen, for 40 days I'm going to talk. How much can you talk about the kingdom of God? Apparently 40 days worth. I mean, and yet it's not mentioned in the church. It's not, we don't see the relevance in our life to why it's there. You know, it says he proved, that word proved means with, with, with evidence that can't be refuted. He proved to them he was alive, which means he just didn't come in as a ghostly figure, although he did kind of just appear, okay? But he would sit down and have meals with them. He would knock on the door. He would go for walks. You know, Thomas, he could stick his hand in his side and see the nail prints in his hands. He proved it. And yet we see him talking about the kingdom of God. The last thing he talks to his disciples about. See, when Christ came to earth, he brought God's kingdom with him. That's why he would say, behold, the kingdom of God is near. You know, hey, pay attention. Here I am. But honestly, it came in part. It came in part. It came in part and is yet to be fulfilled and yet to come. How many would like to see the kingdom of God come? That one day everything's made right, okay? The older I get, the more I hurt. Anybody else besides me? Less things want to function and work properly, okay? I mean, it's like holy buckets. I want no more pain. I want no more sorrow. I want no more tears. Any, it's like, wow, okay, it hasn't come yet. That part hasn't come yet. It's in part. Yet the New Testament writers do confirm that through his death and resurrection, Christ, okay, listen, bound Satan, provided forgiveness and holiness for sinners, and is now enthroned above all. He's above all things. He's sitting on the throne of God. He bound Satan and won the victory over him in Colossians 2.15. In this way, he has disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. He gave his victory over sin, guys. He took it away from us. I love Hebrews 10.10. Okay? For, God, for God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Let that sink in just a little bit. Okay, look around. If you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, did you realize that you're holy? Think about that. You're holy. Right now. This is something that's alive in our life, and we sometimes don't realize that when God sees us through the lens of the blood of Christ that he sees us holy because I woke up this morning and looked in the mirror and wasn't too pretty. Anybody else besides me? Okay. No, my hair wasn't messed up. <laughs> but no, I see myself. I know the unholy things I do, yet I need to understand that when God looks at me, he sees me holy because of the blood of Christ. It helps me operate from a different perspective. It doesn't give me the, the, the privilege of, you know, hey, listen, God sees me holy, so I'm going to go live like hell. Okay, no. It gives me a reason 
It gives me a reason to live for him and to live a life that would please him. Because he already sees me that way. Ephesians 1.19 says, Paul writing, says, I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in a place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. He is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. Verse 22, God has put all things under his authority of Christ and has made him, a, made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. The kingdom, guys. The kingdom of God. Where's it at? And I've been talking about it because, like I said, I'm hyper fixating and it's just a little ADD mind at work, okay? The kingdom of God. It, it, it takes place and, and, and it begins in the believer's heart right now. It's in our heart, the kingdom of God. And because it's taken place in our heart and it's there, we become co-laborers or co-workers with Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 says, For we are co-workers in God's service. He's, he, he didn't, he, he's brought us into his kingdom and we become part of his kingdom for a purpose and a plan that's much greater than what we even consider. I look and I think about what, what God has done in and through this, this little church. Uh, this is the dream most pastors have, and this is the dream I had. Listen, we're going to win Belgrade to Christ. We're going to grow this church so big that we have to, to start a building program. We have to do a campaign and er, raise the money and convince people that we can borrow money, okay, to, to build the building and we'll pay it off and we'll build the new building and we'll just keep getting bigger in one spot. Listen, that's what preachers dream of. Building programs and the legacy that's left behind because, man, there's this great big building and, oh, wow. But God says, no, listen, I want to expand my kingdom, not your kingdom, Curtis. We're going to have, you know, little churches and little places <coughs> making huge impacts. It's going to stress you out. It's going to make your brain hurt. It's going to make your heart ache. But remember, Curtis, it's not about your kingdom. It's about my kingdom. Listen, the only way we can come part of that kingdom, and we had 20 people do that this last week, is through repentance and rebirth. You were part of an earthly kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, and we've been reborn into the heavenly kingdom. How do I know that? Because Jesus said this, Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of God is near. He said in John 3, 3, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. See, we were in the kingdom of darkness. Now we're in the kingdom of light. His kingdom begins in our heart. It begins in our heart and it grows. See, when Christ returned to heaven, He left us His Holy Spirit as a seal and a sign, as power, as authority in our lives. God promised, however, listen, that one day that his kingdom would come, that it would be complete. Listen, I believe it's when kingdom people take seriously their kingdom call that the kingdom of God would come. I wish I could tell you, listen, next week, Tuesday, the kingdom of God is coming. Okay? Man, do I wish I could tell you that. But did you know I can tell you 
exactly when the kingdom of God is coming? I can. Jesus gave us the exact answer. But it's going to take kingdom-minded people that are going to pursue the kingdom of God over their own kingdom. You see, Jesus said this, and the good news in Matthew chapter 4, or 24, verse 14, he says, And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world, and so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. Do you know why the end hasn't come? And you'd think, and, and you know, over the last 50 years where travel has been Really easy. It's not, you know, where you, uh, you got on the boat and your mom stood on the dock and watched you go away not knowing if you were going to return. Now we get on a plane and within, you know, 12 to 18 hours you can be anywhere in the world. But yet it has, the gospel has been preached to all nations, to all people. He said when we do that, the end will come. When there's disciples made of every nation, every tongue, every tribe, every people group in this world. Why is God so concerned with that? Because listen, he didn't die for some. He just didn't die for America. Did you know that? He died for every man, woman, and child. And he says it's his desire that no one should perish, but all should come to repentance and knowledge of the truth. And that means the, the, the native in the deepest, darkest jungle. It means the person that's in the tallest high rise living in the biggest penthouse. Jesus came. He came that his kingdom would be expanded. It started small. And some 2,000 years later, we're still waiting for the kingdom of God to come. It's when we who call on the name of Jesus, who are followers of Jesus, take seriously our call to expand his kingdom, that the end will come. So what is the kingdom of God all about? Well, let's look at Jesus, see what he had to say about it. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus said this, what is the kingdom of God like? How can I illustrate it? It is like a tiny mustard seed a man planted in a garden. It grows and becomes a tree, and the bird makes a nest in the branches. He also asks, what else is the kingdom of God like? Hmm, it's like yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she puts only in a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. Think about that for a minute. There's no analogy that will truly encapsulate the kingdom of God, yet Jesus is giving us a glimpse of what it means. Uh, uh, it, uh, just a picture, just a, a snapshot of part of the kingdom of God as it begins. It begins in our heart. Listen, the, the, the children of Israel were thinking that when the, when the kingdom of God came, that, that Jesus, instead of riding in on a donkey, would ride in on a great white horse, okay? And that he would lead an army behind him, and that Rome would be wiped out. That's what they're thinking. And now he takes and turns it on his head and says, Whoa, time out. It's, it's a mustard seed. It's yeast. Something small, something that, that, is, that, is, that is insignificant, if you will, in the scope of things. It takes 20,000 mustard seeds to make one ounce. 20,000. Yet that single mustard seed, is one, the mustard plant is one of the fastest growing plants. In just a matter of weeks, it will grow to 10 to 12 feet tall. Big enough to bring shade. Big enough that the birds would come and nest in it. Something small. Is it a tree? No, it's a shrub, but the point is made. Why did he use that? Because see, 
When the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our heart, the kingdom of God comes and is seated in our heart. It starts small. It starts with repentance. It starts with with turning around and going the other direction. It starts with the confession of Christ as Lord and Savior. Something small in our lives. But yet it grows and it grows. It grows to the point that even birds can nest in our branches. Now listen, most commentators, when I I tried to study and read this, will tell you there's no significance about the birds. That was Jesus just threw that in, you know, just kind of to paint a picture, to give a little color, a little life to the story. But I I disagree with him. Because see, I think it paints a picture of what the kingdom of God is really supposed to be like. Not only the taking over of our life and us becoming like Christ, but the influence and the comfort and the the care that we bring everyone that's around us. See, the birds were were insignificant. They were they were nothing. And yet they find refuge and shelter within the kingdom of God. Our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers who need comfort and care and shade. They should be able to find it within this body as a group, but also within us individually. See, our lives should make a difference in other people's lives. The kingdom of God should come near them in the same way that Christ came near those disciples. And that they had influence in their, in, in their lives. Jesus didn't only benefit those who followed him, but he benefited everyone that was around him. And see, if the kingdom of God has taken up residence in our life, and we begin to be transformed from that old man to the new man that looks like Christ, it should have huge, significant impact on our community. He goes on to say, you know, it's like a little bit of yeast. I am not a baker, okay? If you give me something to bake, I'll burn it. You give me something to barbecue, and I'm not talking grilling. I'm talking barbecue. I don't care how long it takes to cook it. I can get it right, okay? I like slow, low and slow. That's my method, okay? But I am pretty smart because I watch my mom bake. And how much yeast does it take to make a whole lump of dough rise? Just a little pinch. See, everything around it rises, becomes better, becomes full, becomes life, full of life. Christ taking up residence in our heart should take us all over. Not a portion, but all of us. The kingdom of God should live in all areas of our life. But it also should affect everything that's around us with life. See, people shouldn't know that you're a Christian or a Christ follower, okay, because they see your car parked in the parking lot and they drove by. Truth of the matter is, they drive by, see your car parked in in a church parking lot, they probably think you're a hypocrite like everybody else that goes to church. They look at you a little crossways. Well, you know, those people. See, people should know that we're Christ followers because we bring life, we bring comfort, we bring shade, we bring the arms and the life of Christ. Not by the things that we say or where we go, but who we are at our core. That the kingdom of God would have taken us over to such an extent that we really begin to live like Jesus. I've said it over and over and over again, and it's our next sermon series. And it's about the kingdom of God and how it looks, really. 
how it's lived out. You know, I've said this, and, and it's true, I didn't steal it from anybody. It's mine, okay? It came out of the ADD mind. Preachers are real good, okay? Listen, we read a commentary, we change it 15%, and then it's mine. I created it, okay? All right, it's called plagiarism, but we do it all the time, okay? We just steal, okay? But no, listen, I, I've said this, okay? We need to be like Jesus. Would you guys agree with me? That's our goal as Christ followers, to be like Christ, okay? So that means we need to love like Christ, we need to live like Christ, we need to give like Christ, and we need to serve like Christ. What it means is, is that truly we need to be part of the kingdom of God and allow God to live through us and to, and to be like our Savior. Now, a lot of times what we do at this point is, is we take and we... Um, we're going to have a great campaign, and, and we find a program that fits, and, and we have all the answers, and we have, if you'll do this, 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 and this, and this, oh, wow, okay. But did you know that programs have life cycles? Okay. And programs fall short, and people get involved in programs and get wore out by programs. Anybody else besides me? Okay, now, I'm going to talk to the, to the old folks. You millennial people don't listen, okay? Okay. Our generation and the generations before me like programs and they ran them real well, okay? The millennials hate them. Just absolutely can't stand them. It's programming and they want to be organic, okay? I don't know. It's, it's kind of different to me, okay? But listen, the life cycle of the Christian, okay, does have an end, a beginning and an end to it. Okay, the beginning is when we repent of our sins and turn to Christ and take up our cross and we follow Him. The end of it is, is one day when we stand before Him face to face and we are like Him. Now, there's a fallacy out there that, listen, it doesn't matter what I do from the beginning to the end because I'm going to be like Jesus in the end. That's a fallacy. The truth of the matter is, is that from the beginning of my life to the end of my life, I should be striving to be like Jesus. Because why would I want to be like Jesus in heaven and not be like him today? So we're going to begin a conversation and I'm going to give us some ideas to help us think outside of the box, but, you know, like loving like Jesus, okay? If we look at Jesus, you know, he loved and lifted up the broken. Anybody know a broken person besides me? Sometimes we're broken because of the choices and decisions we made, and sometimes we're broken because someone else made bad choices and decisions. How do we love through that? How do we, how do we respond to and, and help people? Because see, pe broken people are afraid to come to church because you know everybody in church is perfect, right? Got your life all together? No problems, no hang-ups, no hurts, no pains. We come together as perfect people, amen? That's how the world thinks about it. I can't come here because I have that problem. I can't come here because when I was a kid, this happened to me. So we're going to begin to understand that, you know. He enlarged the small. He took the minimalized and the, and the social outcast and he lifted them up and he made them something that no one else could. He took the weak. He showed favor to the weak. And listen, he didn't withhold forgiveness from anybody. That's just kind of where we're going to head. How do we love like Jesus? And we may bring in some practical things to help us think bigger than, than what we normally would think, help us maybe think collectively. But see, it's not going to be a program that's going to say, okay, now sign up and everybody come do this, and we're going to be... No, uh-uh. Because see, you have a, a job, you have friends, you have family, you have access to people that I otherwise won't. And your job is to be like Jesus wherever you are. 
that wherever you go, the kingdom of God goes. The love of God is shed forth on, on, a, on a lost and dying world that desperately needs to see that God loves them and cares about them, has given His life for them. And yes, He, he, he grieves and weeps over the brokenness and the, and the sin and the hurt and the pain, but yet He provides healing and hope and joy in the midst of all of it. It's not going to be an easy journey. We may have to confront our own prejudice and our own problems and issues. But it's the journey of the Bible, guys, where he takes broken people, misfits and oddballs, and does something extraordinary through them that his kingdom would be expanded that we would be like Jesus.